Um, it's really exciting to be here. I'm very happy to uh, find this a great community of people who love cool things. Um, what I'm going to do is show you just a lot of examples of cool things that interest me. Um, I, I have many different hats. I do lots of different things, but I tend to think of myself as a sculptor in many ways. It's sort of the, what holds everything together. Uh, so I'm going to show you just some examples of sculptures very quickly to give you a background on who I am, where I come from. Uh, and I use uh, all different materials, as you see, but 3D printing in various formats is really great for sculpture. Uh, and then at the end, I'll show you some examples. I just got a MakerBot a few weeks ago, and I've, I've begun to use that in certain ways. So let me start by just showing you uh, examples of sculpture. Am I too close? Oh, I'm too, I'm too far. Okay. Can you hear me now? Oh, I'm sorry. All right. So I'm George Hart, and I will show you examples of cool stuff. So uh, category one is just sculpture. I can't tell you about all of them. I'll just mostly show pictures um, and let you know that I always have these geometric ideas in my mind, and I, I think of various ways to bring them out, to somehow figure out some material that can, can carry the form. Uh, and I spend an incredible amount of time, uh, it's really an obsession, uh, to, to build these things out of uh, whatever material seems right for that particular uh, object. Uh, there's many levels of work behind the scenes here where uh, they start with some sort of idea and they mathematicize them in some sense, uh, usually turn them into software in some sense, uh, writing whatever program in whatever language seems to carry it out best. Um, then I have to somehow make it physical, think about the materials. Uh, behind all the things that you see, the materials and the work that goes into that, there's much, much more work that actually goes into various kinds of jigs and experiments and you know, testing. Uh, just different ways to, to make things. Uh, Zach just talked about failures. I've got lots and lots of failures. Uh, I like to do group projects where I bring parts to the public and I say, come help me build this thing. I'll call this a, a sculpture barn raising. So this is one with uh, it's about 10,000 pieces of zone tool that I did in Central Park. Uh, a whole lot of people just came by. This is uh, one for a museum, larger. Uh, many of my sculptures I do in this way where I bring the pieces to a community I put up signs to say, come help me build these things. Um, lots of these are laser cut, so laser cutting allows you to make flat pieces very accurately, um, so you can make cool things like that. They all have a mathematical story. Uh, I won't tell you all the math right here, although please ask questions, but uh, part of what's really cool about this to me, this particular one, is that every pair of pieces meets at a right angle. Okay? You wouldn't believe that to look at this, uh, but there's a simple you know, mortise and tenon joint possible with a laser cutter because Every single piece meets at 90 degrees. Um, uh, this is one I wrote up for uh, Make Magazine a couple of years ago. It's a puzzle. You have to take it apart and put it back together if you like. Um, acrylic. I won't talk about each. Uh, this, this is at MIT. I was an artist in residence there a few years ago and uh, again did this as a group sculpture uh, with a bunch of students. Uh, this is a small model. I think I have a picture here of a, a larger version of that. Um, some of these things are experiments in mechanics, and what's interesting about this design is there's no fasteners, no connectors, no welding or grazing, but everything simply locks into place. I've done lots of experiments with parts that uh, hold themselves together once they're all there. Uh, it means that until you have the last piece there, it just wants to explode. It's a real mess. Uh, but once you get that last one in, it's really, really satisfying. So, so many of these things are puzzles. There's a, there's a very fine line between sculptures and puzzles for me. Um, this is made with a vinyl cutter, so this is just paper. Holds together, there's uh, 60 pieces of paper, each shaped like a three, and you overlap two of them to make that kind of eight shape. And they interweave in this way that only takes about four hours to put together once, once you've failed a whole bunch of times before that and have a good plan. Um, and the plans for this and many of my other uh, works are on my website. You can go to georgehart.com and see lots of things there. This is another one that holds together. These are uh, this is steel cut on a plasma cutter, powder coated, and then it just snaps together. Um, this one also. Um, this was a large piece. This is at a college, Alvin College in Michigan. Um, I think 18,000 pieces. It, it took the whole campus and me a whole day to get this together, but it was really fun. Um, so this is something that I did for the Museum of Mathematics. Um, uh, here's a bunch of uh, people helping me build it at uh, the World Science Festival last year. So I should mention the Museum of Mathematics. Um, I have a kind of a dream job, it's to create a museum. 
uh, of fun, cool things. Uh, so uh, we're opening Manhattan in about a year and a half, in 2012. Uh, we've been raising money and designing exhibits, and if you like cool mathematical things, this will be like a hands-on interactive science museum, uh, just full of fun things to do. Uh, we started by making a traveling exhibit. This is something called the Math Midway, and this was at uh, the World Science Festival last year. We'll be there again this year in June, and you can go to our website. Uh, but this is what I consider kind of a fun thing. It's a square wheel tricycle, but you have a, a smooth ride because you're going on this catenary curve uh, floor that compensates for the bumps. So as you ride, it's a perfectly smooth thing. It's really fun and whimsical. Uh, so we're designing a whole museum. There'll be lots of stuff in there um, that involve uh, 3D printing in one form or another. These are just concept sketches for uh, things that are in the works. Nothing's very definite. Um, but one thing that we will have is a 3D printing exhibit. So this will be something where visitors to the museum can come and they can wave their hands in a magic way in front of some software and objects will be curated on the screen uh, that are 3D printable. Uh, they'll go into a library of things that people uh, created that day, everyone can view it, and then we'll choose some each day to be building. Uh, we'll have a, a printer on the floor for everyone to see that'll be building things and then we'll put them on display. Uh, the, the kiosk might not look exactly like this, but this is a, sort of a current sketch. Anyway, so let me take you from that background to 3D printing. As you can see, I like to work in lots of material, but uh, rapid prototyping type technology allows you to make things that you just couldn't make any other way. You can see that I really like these intricate, complex forms, and uh, you can go really detailed with certain types of technology. Uh, so many of these are made out of a, what's called an SLS machine, selective laser sintering. It's a rather expensive, maybe quarter million dollar machine, but it, it can go in really great details. Um, and uh, so this is, for example, a puzzle. Those 12 pieces on the bottom right just snap together to give you a, a jigsaw puzzle over a sphere. Um, some of these are based on four-dimensional polyhedra and other such things. I'll just mostly whiz through some of these. So I like to do uh, colors in various forms. So this is nylon. This particular material comes out of machine white, but you can uh, dye it with various ways, the sorts of dyes that they sell in the supermarket for synthetic clothing works great on nylon. So I use various sort of watercolor wet techniques to get blends of colors in there. Um, this is based on hyperbolic tessellations and the Poincaré disc. So uh, these are cool ideas that live in mathematical space. And uh, to people with a mathematical training, uh, they're wonderful to think about. They're beautiful, but they're hard to get out into the real world. So here's a series of sculptures where I've tried to take some of those patterns and embed them in three-dimensional shapes, but they're, they're too complex for me to build. There's no way that I, I could carve that out of something and make it uh, as accurate as I would like. Um, but layered fabrication can do this for me. Uh, so these are very, very intricate and uh, really fun to look at. If you see them in person, they're, they're cool to hold and turn around and explore. Um, I'll show you pictures. And again, you can go to my website georgehart.com. Oh, also I wrote some postcards. I put a small pile of postcards on the table to your right, my left, on the corner there. Uh, some about my sculpture and some about uh, the Museum of Mathematics, but feel free to, to take one uh, of those. Um, so again, these kinds of forms are really intricate, and I, I love the fact that I can get them out of my mind, that they, otherwise they'd be trapped in my brain if I didn't have this technology. Uh, this is a really cool one. So this sphere is about six inches in diameter. Uh, I forget how many thousands of rings, but this is basically made of chain mail. Uh, here's a close-up. So this was built, assembled in place on a, uh, a selective laser sintering machine. Uh, can you see the one there that has only five neighbors? Most of them have six neighbors. It's a consequence of Euler's theorem that you have to have exactly 12 that have five neighbors, and the rest will have six neighbors. Uh, in this particular structure. Anyway, so there's one in the middle. Do I have a mouse? Two. Let's see. So this one right here, you see, has five neighbors. Um, so if I go back one click here. So there's actually 12 of these dimples. On the top half, they're hanging down. On the bottom half, they're also hanging down. But the gravity goes down. Um, but you see them on the top half. The bottom half looks like a hemisphere. But no matter how you turn it, uh, because in between, there's uh, rigid places. So uh, on the right, you can see the blue section is where I design the chains to be a little bit larger than in the red section so that they overlap and so it becomes rigid. So without that blue section to give the framework, it would just collapse like a, you know, a sack of chainmail. Um, but the blue gives us a uh, dodecahedral ribs. Anyway, this is the kind of thing that 
I just think it's so neat that you can make this just by typing a few lines into a computer and, and pushing a print button. Um, here's a fractal, so again, there's lots of intricate detail you can make. Um, this is a nice one. So there's one particular brand of 3D printer by uh, Z Corp up in Boston, in Cambridge, uh, that prints in color. It has CMYK and, and clear ink that it prints uh, to, to glue a uh, powdered white binder, and you can make really wonderful things that come out already colored. Uh, here's another view of that. This happens to be a sculpture I did uh, in Washington, D.C. last month. Um, there's a version of the final one. This was a big sculpture barn raising on the mall outside the Smithsonian in D.C. where uh, over two and a half days people came and helped me put together these, uh, again, thousands of uh, triangle pieces. The, this version is laser cut steel. Uh, this is just a model that I made ahead of time uh, to help me uh, be sure it's what I really wanted to invest in, in for the steel. Anyway, so let me come to examples of the MakerBot. As I said, this is new to me. Uh, this is something I've been playing with uh, just in the last few weeks, and I've had a few technical troubles, so it's been down for a while, and I've been out of the country, I've been gone for a while, so I haven't actually had much time with it. Uh, but there it is, uh, and that's my very first ooze. It's kind of a baby picture of it. And my very first object, which is a little uh, tetrahedron there. Uh, and then I quickly wanted to grow to uh, more complex forms. I was very concerned that I would be highly limited by the lack of a support structure to not be able to make the kinds of intricate things I like where um, you have overhanging parts and holes and very high levels of uh, porosity, lots and lots of tunnels and things. It's just part of my, my personal aesthetic. Um, so when I built this, uh, I was very happy that the structure came out well. You can see a little bit of ooze that happens as it moves from one uh, part to the next part. I brought that piece. You can't see anything in the dark here. But I'll hold it up anyways if we can. Um, and it, it came out really well, so just basically with the uh, exacto knife to clean up on that. And over there, you can see on the right uh, how it actually worked out. So that was very encouraging to me. Um, I designed a little connector. Uh, this is just basically an icosahedron connector that gives me uh, five, six degree angles around the vertex um, so that I can build an icosahedron. This was a, a test. I haven't yet uh, gone to the, the full 